Okay, so Baruch Hashem. So we're now speaking about how Hashem is bringing this light into the world. And this light is coming, Mamish, into all of creation. And because Hashem did not decide to just keep the light up there in the Midas, that's why we have more and more finite levels of existence. Otherwise, the world would have just been this basically infinite, as close to infinite as you could get, level of existence. But Hashem wanted there to be more and more finite levels of existence. So that's what we're holding. And He's explaining how that's happening through the letters of Torah. It's important to note that this is literally written by one of the greatest sages in the last thousand years, the Balatanya. Just so important to keep the thought. We're reading the words of the Balatanya, Shner Zalman of Liadi, who would fast an entire week to know if he should add an extra vav to a sentence or not use the vav. Every word here is filled with Kedusha. I'm talking about human beings that were basically angels that devoted themselves to Hashem in the most unbelievable ways. But they weren't just like saints on a mountain, disconnected from the people, not getting married. People were that were with the people, families, meeting tens and th thousands of people, being there for them, helping them through their life problems. There's one thing to just be a great, a great scholar who knows all the secrets. But to have that with the humanness of just absolute love for other people is real greatness. So we're reading words from someone who understands reality, mamish. Ma underst and somebody wants to challenge the Balatanya, so you know you could bring it on. But the Balatanya, he's powerful. So just important to know when somebody will say something like, "Oh, they'll make some comment." You want to challenge the words of the Balatanya? So, do you know, first of all, did, did you read the Tanya? Do you know the Tanya? And speaking to anybody in the world that wants to challenge the Balatanya, or will make a comment like, oh, you know, where do you get these ideas from? You want to come learn the Balatanya? Come and learn, and you'll see what's really going on here. You want to challenge the ideas? Come and challenge it from an educated place. So here the Balatanya is explained. Just to, just have to see who we're speaking about. So Hashem was mitzamtzem, this or, in this light, in order that it should come, this, oisius, in order to create finite existence, Hashem said that we're going to use the asara ma'amoros, the ten utterances of the creation of the world, but if He left it, at that place, the world would look very, almost infinite. But Hashem wanted to move creation into more finite levels. How was that done? By taking the Asara Ma'amaras and moving the letters around as we described. <speaking in Hebrew> By moving the letters around, like we mentioned, just like an anagram or bananagrams. If you have the letters mixed up, it conceals the original message. I think I used toe last time. Toe, so I've read O-E-T. So there's a concealment of toe. So when Hashem takes the original letters of the creation of the world, which were the ten midos, the ten essential spheres of Hashem, which are very close to infinite existence, and then we're talking about how do we take that almost infinite existence and move it into coarser levels of creation? We need to conceal the infiniteness of it. So you do that by moving around the letters, just like moving around the letters would conceal the original message. So too, moving around the letters of creation will conceal that light and make things more coded, where you don't, just like if I give you a code, blue 27 eagle, Polar bear, 14, palm tree. So I'm not talking about palm trees or eagles. I'm giving a code, but I've muddled the message. 
I've made the original transmission more concealed, so too that's what moving the Hebrew letters around is concealing the light in order to allow for lower levels of creation to emerge. A greater concealment is by what's called gematria. Gematria takes the concealment and makes it even more. Because you're not even talking about a palm tree anymore, you just give a number. A number is a very big concealment. The Svarim talk about that there's three main levels of the message of a letter. So if you have an aleph, you have the shape of the aleph. The shape of the aleph is a yud on the top, a vav in the middle, and a yud on the bottom. That's one meaning of aleph. Then you have aleph spelled out an aleph, a lamed, and a fe. That's another meaning of the letter. But then you have an aleph being the gematria, the numerical aleph of one, representing the power that it has is one. It has one to it. So if I just take one, if I just say the letter one, one as a number is very disconnected from aleph from an Aleph, Lamed, Fe, or from a Yud, and a Vav, and another Yud. Numbers remove things from their essence a little bit. They conceal it. Numbers are dehumanizing. That's why the Nazis, Yimach Shemam, one of the most dehumanizing things, and everybody knows this, is to be given a number, to lose your name, to lose your identity and be given a number. Numbers conceal Right? We all appreciate that. A number conceals, even though it hints to something, but it's concealing the original concept. So when we say that Hashem then takes Hebrew letters and He turns them into numbers, the idea there being is concealing that light even more in order to allow for more finite levels of creation to exist. So if I just give you a code that's a number, if I speak to you in numbers, that's very encrypted. It's a very encrypted language. I'm just imagining right now two mathematicians, like a boy and a girl, like two genius mathematicians going on a date. And they're talking to each other in numbers. So it's, it's very encrypted, but they understand what they're talking about. But it's, it's, it's a lot more encrypted than just talking to each other, using letters, even though it means something. There's a message there. There's a message in the numbers. And if you know the message in the numbers, then you could follow the code back, just like in the Matrix. You could follow the code. You look at a website. You ever did this? You're, like, you're on the computer, and then you press some button, all of a sudden like this screen pops out, and it's like, you're like, what is that? It's like the coding of the page or something. It, you have no idea what it is. I remember looking at a website one time. We were building one many years ago with a friend of mine. And the person that was building it, we were saying like, it, it would be nice if it had a certain graphic that was like brighter. So he's like, oh, no problem. So all of a sudden, the page goes and it's just like all these numbers. He's like, let me just brighten it up over there. Like, how did you do that? He just added a couple numbers. Like, what do you mean? I don't say, and he's like, just wait, just watch. And all of a sudden, you're back to the page. Oh, how, how'd you do that? Just a bunch of numbers. One, zeros. That's the coding that's going to bring me to brightness or music or song? Answer is yes. But it's concealed. If you know the code of the numbers, then when you look at that coded page, you can see the messages there on the page. But you could hear how it's more concealed, right? much more concealed. Numbers conceal the concept a lot. So in order for Hashem, this is the, the design that He chose, to make lower levels of creation, He brought it into numbers. Because every single time that you move letters around or you bring it into numbers, you're concealing that great light obscuring the light in order to allow for a creation that could actually think that the light that's creating it does not exist. 
that somebody can actually get a PhD in denying God. That's how concealed God made his existence down in this world. I said, that, by the way, that's a miracle. It's a miraculous thing. That God would conceal himself and could do it to such a degree that even as somebody is denying God's existence, God is invigorating the pen that's writing the thesis to deny God as he's being illuminated by God at that moment. It's an unbelievable level of concealment. So this is describing how he's doing that. And as you move the letters around more and you change things into numbers, you're concealing more and more and more. Making lower levels of creation. In the original ten Ma'amaras that Hashem created the world, Hashem and the creation is filled with light. This is very high level of creation. Hashem said, I don't want to remain up there. I want the creation to exist on lower and lower finite levels. Like we spoke about, that when you convert everything into numbers, you're very low in the world of creation. The light is being very concealed. You want to say something, Mandy? Now look what he says, beautiful. After Hashem has concealed his light more and more and more and more. The kayotz behem kasher gozrach achmosa yisborach, who shehaya yochol or. Hashem concealed his light so much that Hashem's ore can even come into Kamoy Avonim, to the lowest levels of creation that God is creating rocks. Literally, just mineral life. It's not even animated. There's four levels of creation there's Doimim, Tsoimea, Chaim, Daber. Doimim means mineral life. Soimeh means plant life. Chai means animal life. Medaba means humans. Those are the four levels of life. Each one has greater illumination, greater animation, more revealed God aliveness. A rock is not so alive. Even though we're learning here that there's God energy filled in the rock. The rock wouldn't exist without God. Plant life is more revealed because it's animated. It moves. It doesn't get up and walk away, but it grows. But much more animated than a plant is, is an animal. Have you ever seen horses? You looked in their eyes? It's a lot, you, you swam with dolphins before? It's very powerful, by the way. Dolphins are amazing. They're so, they're like there. They're there. Animals are. So it's, it's more than just looking at, you know, a bunch of uh, uh, mint bush growing, which is very nice also. It's, it's, it's a lion. I went to watch a leopard. It's very, an eagle. You seen a bald eagle? It's like, wow, it's majestic. It's beautiful. But even more illumination is a human being. A human being is das. A human being speaks. It's very powerful. And the human being has a, another level of intelligence. Like the Rambam points out, that one of the proofs of the greatness of the human is that even though the lions are stronger, the cheetahs are faster, the, the animals are mightier, the, the, the elephants are stronger and bigger, a human being can put them in a zoo. Because we have intelligence. Even though, how would they? We, it should be that they would put us in zoos. 
It's the human intelligence. Now, I'm not telling you to put animals in zoos. It's just showing you that there's some intelligence that we have that makes us different. The human being is different. We're not just an ape. The human being is different, is special. From the point of creation. So those are the four levels of creation. What the Balatanya is pointing out here, though, is that even in the level of creation of the stone, the stone is filled with godly energy and godly letters. And he points out now particularly which name of God stones come from. Certain types of stones. There's different. There's, there's Islay, Evan, there's Islay, Evan. There's different types of stones, the Zoya says. A stone by way of analogy. Shma Moira, the name of stone. How do you spell stone in Hebrew? Aleph, Beis, Nun. By the way, when we go to a Beis Chaim, when we go to a cemetery, which we call Beis Chaim, we call a home for the living, because we know that even after a person passes on, they're very much alive. To the degree that they kept Torah and mitzvahs, they're very, very alive. One of the customs is that we take a stone and we put it on the grave. Why do we do that? So one meaning is that found in the very word itself of Evan is what we're doing. Is that we're saying that your life did not just end. That I'm coming to be here and show honor and respect to you shows that I'm a continuation of you, of what you represent. I'm a continuation, whether I'm your son or whether I'm spiritually connected to you as someone who taught me things. I'm here to continue on the legacy and the positive message that you brought into the world. So I put an Evan because an Evan is a fusing of two words, Av, Ben. So that there's a father and there's a son. There's a, there's a continuation. Av, Ben, Evan. Aleph, Beis, Beis, Nun. That's an Evan. So here, Evan means something else. Where does Evan come from? There's four ways to spell out Yud Kei Vav Kei. Fully. Right? A Yud, what does a Yud look like? Doot. A little Yud. It's the smallest of the letters. But how do you spell Yud? Yud. Yud Vav Dalet. Which, by the way, Yud is the beginning of creation. And even the letter Yud, creation started with this point. Even the letter Yud is hinting to creation because it starts with a Yud. Then the Yud becomes a Vav. There's an extension of the Yud. And then the line becomes a Shetach, moves into a Dalit. It's moving sideways. Even the letter Yud is revealing how creation happens. So Yud is a Yud Vav Dalit. How do you spell Hey? There's three ways. Either Hey Yud, Hey Hey, or Hey Aleph. How do you spell Vav? Three ways. Vav Yud Vav, Vav Aleph Vav, or Vav Vav. How do you spell Hey again? Hey Yud, Hey Hey, or Hey Aleph. So if you add all that up, there's four ways to spell Yud Ke Vav Ke. The first way is called Ab which is the Gemachia 72, is Yud Vav Dalad, He Yud, Vav Yud Vav, He Yud. The second way is called Sag, which is you take the Vav and you substitute the Yud for an Aleph in the Vav. So it's Yud Vav Dalad, He Yud, Vav Aleph Vav, He Yud. Then the third way is called Ma, Gematria Ma 45, which is Yud Vav Dalad, which is with Alephs, Alphen, Yud Vav Dalad, He Aleph, Vav, Aleph, Vav, and He, Aleph. Then the fourth way is Ban, okay? Ben, which is with He's, is Yud, Vav, Dalad, He, He, Vav, Vav, He, He. Those are the four ways of expressing out Yud, Ke, Vav, Ke. And those are the four names that correspond to the four spiritual worlds. And there's a lot more 
of what that all means. It's important that you know those four names, Ab Sagma Ban. Okay? Ban represents the lowest world. An Evan comes from the world of Ban with an Aleph. So as God is bringing his light through the worlds, an Evan comes from the world, the world of Ban and the shame Ban, and an Aleph, which is really coming from Ma. And for more real detail on this, this is called Mamish Kabbalah. But the Balatanya felt that we should know a little bit of it even here in the Tanya. As Hashem knows why he put that Aleph there from another one of his names in order to create Evan. What he's pointing out though is that all of creation is being built through the Hebrew letters. In a shame ban ba'atzmai, we're just going to finish the perik, and then we'll start next week perches. In a shame ban ba'atzmai, who ba'oy lomis el yoinim me'oid raksha alde tzimtzumim rabim va'atzumim madreg le madreg yard me menu chiyis muot be me'oid me'oid ad she yonchal is labish be'evin. Even though the shame ban is in a very very high place. You take the shame ban and you also move it through chalufim of Oisius and gematris, and you're bringing that shame down until it's being concealed more and more and more until you literally get to an evan. But know that the shoyrish of where it's coming from is from the shame ban. And this is what it means when the Arizal said the, the, the rocks have souls. What's the answer? Yes but low-level soul. Soul means undiluted God consciousness. That which is enlivening the thing. So yes, rocks have a soul, but not a soul like we do. Our soul is way loftier, way loftier, unfathomably loftier. Because our soul comes from a very high place, which is a very revealed level of God consciousness. Whereas the rocks, it's concealed, 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 but it's all from the same God. And this soul is that which is creating the stone, something from nothing. As we mentioned before, those who sadly, foolishly think that God created the world and then left, because they make a fatal mistake, a critically fatal, fatal mistake, that they believe that God creates the world something from something. Like those that want to say, well, the world just evolved from the soup. And what's the response to that? Where did the soup come from? It's very nice that you just start with a bunch of soup. But where did the soup come from? There's no answer to that question. Creation is the logical answer. That yeah, there was no soup. There was something that transcends soup. It's called the infinite. And then what Kabbalah is answering is the system of getting to every level of creation. More and more finite levels of creation. And because God is creating the world something from nothing, He's constantly involved in the creation. God can't be divorced from the creation. Meaning God could stop creating. He wouldn't stop to exist. He's, he's necessary existence. The world would. Chas v'shalom. But if, if God stops creating, then the world stops existing. Chas v'shalom. But God, the world existing is necessary that God is constantly giving to it something from nothing. Because we're an extension from God, like we're going to speak more of, that God knows the world because He knows Himself. God knows the world because He knows Himself. We're not outside of God. We're like the ray of light coming from the sun. We're an extension. We're emanating from God. 
And all that happened with creation was a perspective change that we, it, we, it looks like we're separate. But from God's perspective, we're all inside of Hashem. And our job through learning Torah and growing is to remove the concealments and the lie of being separate. That Hashem is creating us ma'ayin liyesh b'kol rega. And this is what it means, ma'ala kolam, and that Hashem fills the worlds. This that goes into creating a rock, that energy is called Hashem fills the worlds. And therefore, in every element of existence, God is completely saturated. Which is not the case, the, the light that we said of Hashem that is surrounding the world, not physically, but beyond, which is like the thought of creation, that is beyond. That's not, that's not, uh, it's not permeating every part of existence. Mamalakolam, that's how we started the whole chapter. Mamalakolam, that Hashem fills the world, that is in every part of existence. And Hashem is beyond Mamalakolam, He's beyond Sevakolam, He's beyond all of this. We're just starting to discuss places that we can start to discuss from. The Kol Koyach Madrega Yachal Livroi Buruim Kafi Bechinis Madrega Zu Gam Kain La Enkates Vatachlis. Nothing can stop. Hashem brings this light into this world, fills it in this world that's called Malakol Amen. And it's a good thing that he did so because now we have finite existence and we exist as we know it in order to use a world where Hashem is concealed to activate free will, to draw close to Hashem, become the masters of our perfection. We should be Zaycha Mamish to be the masters of our perfection, to reveal God's truth and beauty for all of humanity. Amen. 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 Call to my friends. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Adam.